tourism, service learning, internships, practicums, um, as I had stated. It incorporates interdisciplinary settings and intentionally places students in roles that they've not experienced before. Specific disciplines like ours use a scaffolding approach that bridges theory to practice through these experiential processes. In social work, for example, experiential learning includes classroom activities in which students go into the field, volunteerism, which is required, practicums, and then, then these cl clinical internships that are much more robust. All of these situations, students are embedded in community agencies. For the Master of Social Work program, we usually use about 60 community agencies for these internship placements. So in general, experiential learning provides many benefits to our students, as you all probably know. The process of immersion challenges their own beliefs, provides them with a wider worldview and test biases that they uh, come face to face with in these real world situations. Students are faced with social injustice, um, are able to understand social responsibility at a deeper level. This type of learning promotes community awareness and exposure to social issues. Um, and in turn, again, testing those biases that they hold um, and encouraging social responsibility. It provides the opportunity for students to understand the environment from new perspectives. Um, in essence, it brings theory to practice in ways that classroom only training just simply cannot do. Other benefits of experiential learning include workforce preparation, face-to-face -face interaction. They provide enrichment over concepts such as inclusive design, social responsibility, and social justice, all of which we address in our programs. So, for example, Moffat and Fletcher found that two key elements specific to influencing motivation among college students were a sense of control and personally important content. Experiential activities provide this. They mitigate the negative effects of things like toxic stress that students bring with them. They help build resilience. These types of learning experiences provide students with some control over their choices and offer a personal connection to chosen experiences which enhance motivation and allow them to build on learning inside and outside of the classroom. Well, we may think that experiential learning and these types of situations may actually produce undue stress and may make worse the effects of toxic stress. We have found that experiencing positive stress and learning to manage new opportunities may actually offer a restorative or reparative opportunity for students who've experienced toxic stress. And that we have also found that attendance in college may help with this healing process and provide opportunities for empowerment and gaining a sense of purpose. And Juriano and Barone noted the importance of a sense of purpose and that early life adversity was associated with lower levels of purpose in adulthood. Collaborations occur organically in the field, and it's really important to look at unconventional partnerships, such as what we're doing today, to further enhance student learning. The foundation learning in our respective professions is actually grounded in theoretical constructs. And these things such as inclusive design and social justice, which are underpinned by social responsibility. Inclusive means including rather than excluding people in using a product or environment. So in social work practice, interestingly enough, much like what Dr. Julian's talking about, we are also underpinned by social justice. We didn't realize the commonalities until we've had some, some conversations about that. Our code of ethics requires that we work from this perspective. Social justice is described in our code of ethics, the social work code of ethics, as the pursuit of social change on behalf of vulnerable and oppressed populations, that individuals and groups of people. Social change efforts, are focused primarily on issues of poverty, 
unemployment, discrimination, and other forms of injustice. In our role to promote the general welfare of society, we advocate for living conditions conducive to fulfilling people's basic needs, promoting social, economic, political, and cultural values and institutions that will promote social justice. These concepts are all foundational to social responsibility. These concepts are also best understood from a theory to practice pedagogy in which classroom instruction is married with community-based experiences such as our internships, which have been, uh, you know, obviously detoured because of the pandemic. One quick key question that we've had is um, how are we? How do we navigate this pandemic and virtual learn and virtual learning? And how do we ensure these abstract concepts are operationalized within the experiential learning environment? So some key issues that we've faced and we feel like higher education in general has faced with regard to this in the wake of this pandemic um, have been the sudden, we had a very sudden change in our calendar and a quick move to online, as you all probably also experienced. We moved over 3,000 courses from classroom face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online um, back in uh, March of last year. That was a, a one-week transition, which was pretty <laughs> unwielding. Uh, we had a lack of guidelines for students in clinical settings regarding face-to-face -face versus virtual care. So clinically students who were doing therapy sessions face to face had to move to a virtual environment with little little uh, protocol in place um, provided by their agencies we saw a reduction in available internships and types of settings available for this community-based learning opportunity um, an example is that our tennessee department of children's services which is akin to a child welfare agency um, declined interns this fall we typically have six to ten students in those internships and those internships are attached to paid stipends. Um, that means that their students were the students were getting their education paid for. Uh, they had to very quickly look for alternative ways to pay for their enrollment in the program, which was a hardship for them. Accreditation requirements for our organizations, our, our, our departments, um, were not being met, and our accrediting bodies made changes to accommodate the number of hours that were required in field. That was actually a bit helpful. Students experienced economic stress as well. We saw so many students where their physical and emotional need health was compromised. We saw many students unable to manage the totality of school, work, internship, family, and the worries related to the pandemic. In essence, many of our students were experiencing social and economic injustice while attempting to understand it from an external academic lens and how it affects others. We also found that some agencies actually did want students to report to their internships, but our university had policies prohibiting that. So we had to navigate that as well. Um, we actually now, more than ever, as you all know, have to think about the health related ramifications of our students and our staff, our faculty, as we plan these face to face interactions between students and industry. So as Dr. Harden mentioned, the health of the students, faculties, and now we're talking about internships. So the industry professionals in the field have come into our conversations like never before. And so we had to think about that and the actual face to face, if they could even occur between students and industry. Um, we had trouble with team based work, which has been limited and we've had to make accommodations for that, which greatly affects the learning process and the ability of students and capacity of students to engage with one another in creative ways. One of the things that we saw quite often was we were unable to use simulation equipment and more expensive equipment and that diminished the robustness of the academic environment. For design, the virtual experience is inclusive of demonstrations and observations. And we have to teach, we had to teach our students these best practices using an online platform. And because experiential learning immerses participants in an active and shared learning environment, we had to really think about what we were doing in that respect. Um, things that we had to think about were experience and exploration by doing what were they sharing and reflecting 
how were they analyzing this information? Um, so that became a little bit problematic as we were taking our students and our participants through a real life environment. And our goal was to optimize opportunities and focus on essential skills. So we did uh, quite a bit around online learning, as you all can well imagine. Um, we did a lot of trainings with industry, with agencies. For example, rather than being able to talk about cognitive behavioral theory in, in the classroom as much, we would engage uh, agencies to provide workshops and trainings around that that they could connect them to their internships. We use a lot of virtual tools provided um, that, that supported both the faculty and students. There were stress-related mental health workshops conducted throughout our campus, um, obviously virtually for students uh, through our counseling center. Um, discuss, specific discussion boards, well that was not me and I apologize for whatever just happened there. Um, got a little out of, out of control. Um, specific discussion boards and reflective papers that bring theory to practice through critical thinking exercises have become even more important as we do this work on virtual platforms. So we had to go in, I can speak specifically for myself, and add some assignments that um, would be more, had been a maybe had been a speaking or a discussion in class to make sure that students were doing this in this virtual environment um, and making these connections between the theoretical aspects and the real life of this virtual internship, which um, had, was very interesting. We also, unfortunately, I guess, had been able to use a lot of current events to explore concepts related to social justice, social responsibility, and inclusion. So um, the, uh, there was an operational task force put together by the university that addressed this move to virtual um, learning and the issues related to the pandemic. Courses were then were now offered, and you all may already have been offering these. We were doing this in very uh, minimal, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I apologize, guys. I don't know why this is moving, but I am not touching it. I promise. I don't know what's happening. Anyway. Um, somebody's popping around our PowerPoint. At any rate, we had five different methods now now on campus, which actually probably is a good thing that we've been able to transition more. Conventional, web-assisted, remote, hybrid, and online. Accreditation bodies changed some of the methodology and requirements um, so that we could uh, we had to continue reporting outcomes, student-led outcomes, but things like internship hours were uh, modified for us. So typically a student would take a 400 hour internship. If they were allowed to do it for 340 hours and a 500 hour internship went to 425 hours. So for this academic year, we have 123 students in the social work department ready for internships and field placements, 71 in our undergrad program and 52 in the graduate program. And we're still looking for opportunities um, and trying to mitigate their health risk and health concerns with going back into the actual communities. It's been very difficult. In social work practice, we actually have nine competencies that we have to also address. Um, some of those, are related to ethical behavior, diversity and difference, and addressing human rights. Translating that into a virtual environment has been very challenging. And while we can do individual sessions and individual work, um, we haven't really mastered the idea of looking at social change from that bigger macro picture and bringing in uh, legislators or other folks who are change agents in in this type of uh, virtual setting. That's still something that we're working on. For design, um, we have an organization called Interior Design Educators Council that offered nationwide virtual internships and an e-internship, which is basically a module-based program with resources that an educator could use mm -hmm. to create and advance an internship within their program. And it provided resources um, for projects assignments, but we could tailor it to each institution requirements. The COVID-19 crisis has been incredibly disruptive in face-to-face -face interaction, but through these module types applications, we are able to navigate the process. 
The university used a number of resources to support the transition for our internships. Um, and they've been extremely supportive um, for internships and these experiential learning opportunities. Resiliency made it work. But in some respects, there's no real replacement for some of this face-to-face -face learning. And things just have to be done face-to-face. But the ability of the students and the faculty and industry, especially industry, to adapt has made it as successful as possible. Um, for us, the CARES, there was certain CARES funding specifically for experiential learning and our e-engage that tailored to that effect. And Dr. Harden alluded to economic distress, so there were some specific allowances for housing, food, and services for our students as well. So really, I think what, what it has taken, other than just this immeasurable mobilization of um, larger bureaucratic organizations, which has been pretty amazing to watch, um, we've had to really increase our creativity and our flexibility and be open to novel ideas ensure opportunities for students to discuss theory in the context of these virtual practice settings, either through video conferencing, uh, using other things like Dropbox, online discussion boards. And this means that our instructors, myself included, uh, must provide better and more appropriate prompts and inquiry so that it really engages the student from that theoretical perspective when we're not having them kind of captured in the classroom for those discussions. We've used photos, video recordings to assist students in the field with depicting their experiences through this theoretical lens, added support to field agencies and industry, which, which has included conferencing and opportunities with professionals and students to, to actually work together in workshop settings, readiness for students who need accommodation, accommodations or those who are not technologically adept has been a big challenge and we, we've worked on that ensuring that our agencies have access to the appropriate technology. For example, software, as Dr. Julian talked about, um, some of that software was only available on campus. So there, there was some technology um, things that, that occurred to help promote access to that. Import, um, it really has been important that faculty be open, flexible, and creative through this process more than ever. And you know, we have got to assist students and we, we found that we have had to assist students and provide some dispensation to them as they're also navigating this pandemic themselves and continually reminding ourselves of the unique um, issues and needs that they're also facing. So that kind of wraps us up for Thank today. We talked some about our challenges and the things that we've tried to do. Um, we're happy to open for questions. I think it, it appears we've got about seven minutes um, the last slide provides our references, some things that we um, referred to. So I guess I'll open the discuss the conversation um, and see if there are any discussions or Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Christy and Vicky. Um, I thought it was fascinating to see because, I mean, it's obviously an extreme challenge if you have such a such an such a hands-on uh, uh, course of education and and a course of education that is supposed to make enable people to apply their knowledge and they and they lose the opportunities to to, right. to, to exercise that so um, I, I saw that we have a couple of questions in the chat so um, Regina you wanted to address that Vicky Dr. Harden Sure, I think Philip is going to. Um, go yeah. On. So, so the first question from from Regina was about the question um, whether you think that you'll keep some of the things that you have now learned about essentially in the future. So, are there things that you want to keep on in your in your courses of study? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one thing I'm currently working on is some best practices around virtual clinical um, activities. So, for example, some of our agencies had some protocols in place because they've been doing telehealth types of things, but not where they could actually shadow and monitor students in the course of these virtual uh, therapy sessions. So I'm working, I'm, I'm working on some best practices based on some of our code of ethics and different things so that we can do trainings with our, with our agencies. I think as a university, we have embraced online learning more than before. 
Um, I think, as a matter of fact, some of the coursework, what I've just been told, and I think, uh, Dr. Julian, you may have heard this as well, they are looking at adding more online courses or virtual learning opportunities. So that, that was a big shift for us. We had some in pockets, but not um, at the level that we look like we're going to be doing. So I think it has opened us up um, to more opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, question is uh, from Gabi. She was wondering whether you were in touch with other universities, whether uh, domest domestically or internationally. So is that something that has maybe helped you navigate the, the pandemic in some way? Yeah. Did you want to? I would say the first thing I did <laughs> is call my colleagues, everybody that I could think of in, the, in, in and out of my program, not just design, but other disciplines to see how they were faring. And we fared better than most. Um, I was um, thinking that our particular institution, some, some of the faculty had layoffs. Um, they had to take on over what they call overloads, increased more normal classes. We were taking on double sections, but um, they were um, furloughs. Um, and then we all discuss what we could do in, within our disciplines and out of our disciplines to be creative with our coursework. So definitely, um, I have to, um, I would say North America and then some of my colleagues outside um, globally as well. How about you, Dr. Harden? Yeah, Gabby, our graduate level social work program that prepares people to be clinicians is actually part of a three university consortium with two other schools in the state of Tennessee. So we immediately sort of gathered that consortium together and made some uh, plans around serving those students. We share students so they can actually register for classes between the three universities. So that was our first big, I think, task and challenge that we had to overcome. So absolutely we have, and we've um, also been in contact with universities across uh, the United States. I haven't personally uh, been in touch with universities outside of the States at this point, but I'm very interested to know how, how they're navigating this as well. Oh, thank you very much. So um, the next question um, was whether um, there were changes in the tuition. Um, I think you said that uh, some of your students um, receive stipends for doing work during their uh, course of study. So that would mean they, they put in work to have uh, their studies paid for if they cannot do that work. So is it, is, are there possibilities for them to have a less, less of a financial burden for, for these limited, probably in some ways limited courses of study? Yeah, unfortunately, with that those stipend programs, the state of Tennessee was paying those and they chose not to. So our students had to get pretty creative. But within the university, they did do some uh, I think they they did some reimbursements and that type thing to help offset the cost. And they pr provided some uh, funds, I guess you would say, to help students address their immediate basic needs that they weren't able to address. And some of the students actually got refunds. Yeah. Okay. I remember so, so, seeing, I have two adult children who were mm -hmm. in college, and I remember them saying that they got a six hundred dollar rebate or stipend or something okay. that their tuition. So they got yes. So there were some. There were ways of addressing the the question yeah. of whether all the tuition is sort of necessary if the if the experience isn't at 100%. Okay, thank you very much. So, and the, and the final question from the chat is, if it's in general possible to translate some of the things that students would do normally in their in their practical activities to digital or online context, the, the example that Britta uses is the question of consulting. So, um, are you thinking about trying to transition things uh, into the online world to tackle the pandemic and to tackle education during the pandemic? Yeah. We have certainly had to do that. So, so we have set, helped agencies set up um, compliant, confidentiality compliance uh, settings where the student can log in and a client or a patient can log in and do uh, sessions online like that. And then they've done some telephone work uh, with folks, with, with, with clients in different settings. So we are definitely um, in the process of making those types of accommodations. I hope I'm answering your question, Britta. It's a little tricky because of confidentiality and FERPA and privacy, but we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's, it sounds like some uh, sounds like a domain where you have your work cut out for you because obviously managing these formal requirements alongside the question of how to provide good education is is obviously a, a very very big challenge. Um, well, people are already thanking you uh, hearty, uh, heartily in the chat, and um, uh, I think I can only chime in with that. It was a very very nice presentation, and I, I personally found it very um, interesting because um, it's it's a there the challenges are manifold and i think yours are very very particularly uh, sort of meaningful because obviously trying to provide education that will serve the community um is something that is very important and it's something that has been put under a lot of pressure by the pandemic so thank you very much for for your thank presentation you. thank you for attending and thank you for asking those uh, relevant questions Yes, um, thank you all. We just appreciate so much your time and attention. We know it's valuable. Thank you for this opportunity.